Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Carlin Smith. I'm from Consumers Energy, and Consumers Energy is really honored to be a sponsor of the Northwest Michigan Housing Summit. And uh, we certainly want to recognize and appreciate the work that's being done, not only by Housing North, but really by all of you in Northern Michigan to address the housing crisis here. So thank you. And I'm so glad we continue to host this summit annually as a way to bring attention, share ideas, and, and, and gather new expertise as we, as we navigate through this crisis. So as I mentioned, I'm Carlin Smith. My title is Community Affairs Manager for Consumers Energy. Here I serve seven counties in Northern Michigan. Some of you will know my colleagues, Eric Gustad and Doug DeYoung, who also serve other parts of this region. So uh, if you'll allow a brief sponsor message before we get started with our keynote address this morning, um, uh, we're really asking all of you as Consumers Energy to become what we're calling a force of change. Um, and to work with us as, and look at innovative ways to provide um, energy to our customers in the coming years, as well as energy savings. So our company truly embraces that triple bottom line of people, planet, and prosperity. And taking care of our planet is really a top priority for this company. And that's why our new clean energy plan calls for the elimination of coal production by 2025. Yes, 2025. So that's just four years from now and 15 years ahead of our previous plan. So in all, our goal is to reach net zero emissions by the year 2040, and Consumers Energy is one of the leading utilities in the country in our quest for net zero. So please join us on this journey by looking for ways in your homes and in your businesses uh, to see ways that you can conserve energy. We do have programs available where we can send experts into your homes and businesses to conduct audits and provide equipment and sometimes even rebates on, uh, on other tools to help you save energy and save money uh, for all of you. So visit our website to learn more. So one of the perks of being a sponsor uh, of the Housing Summit and being on the board for Housing North is that I get to the opportunity to introduce the keynote speaker. And so I'm thrilled to have that uh, responsibility this morning. We're honored to have with us um, Journalist and author Ray Suarez, uh, most recently, Ray was the host of the Al Jazeera America's Daily News program, Inside Story. He spent 14 years as a correspondent and anchor at public television's nightly newscast, the PBS NewsHour, where he rose to become chief national correspondent. His careers included coverage of the 9-11 attacks on New York City and Washington, D.C., and four presidential elections. In 2004 and 2008, Ray moderated uh, presidential candidates debates that were broadcast on PBS and HDNet. For six years, Ray was the host of NPR's Talk of the Nation and was described by the New York Times as the thinking person's talk show host. As an author, in 2013, he wrote the companion volume to the PBS documentary series, Latino Americans. In 2005, he published an examination of the tightening relationship between religion and electoral politics called The Holy Vote, The Politics of Faith in America. His first book looked at the decades of transition in urban America and was called The Old Neighborhood, What We Lost in the Great Suburban Migration. So you can learn more about Ray and read his list of many awards and accolades on the conference website. There's a bio there with, with his listing, so be sure to, to read that uh, in more detail. Um, but we're just kind of excited to have Ray with us to maybe share some observations as a journalist um, who, to provide, you know, great insight on how we live, work, play, vote, survive, and thrive in our country today. Uh, he's had many uh, experiences and, and chances to be a great observer of all of that, and we hope that he can share some of those stories with us. So we look forward to how those observations connect to affordable housing crisis in our country, and it's an honor to uh, welcome Ray Suarez to Northern Michigan, albeit virtually. Uh, so welcome, Ray. Thank you for being with us. Thanks a lot for the introduction, Colin. Hello, all, and thank you for having me with you today. When Tony Lenti and I began corresponding about having me as a speaker for this conference, it was during the depths of the pandemic, and being able to see you all in person seemed unlikely. And we proceeded that with the assumption that I would be remote, uh, sitting a safe distance of 750 miles away. For a while there, we made the kind of progress that promised a better late 2021, and I began to plan to come in person, and yet here I am, in my office down the hall from my bedroom, the place where I've spent too much of the last 21 months, but glad to be with you all the same. I regret having to talk to you from my house because I like Northwest Michigan, a place I've been before, uh, Petoskey, Traverse City, 
Charlevoix, Manistee, Sleeping Bear Dunes. I've been to them all. My late friend, Bob Pizer, saw what was coming in your part of the state. And after retiring from the news business in Detroit, he opened Stonehouse Bread in 1995 as the audience for organic bread, artisan loaves, spectacularly sourced ingredients did nothing but grow in the years since then. And from a literal mom and pop, Stonehouse moved to an enormous bakery in Traverse City. Back in the 90s, Bob told my wife and told me that a great future was coming, that we should buy a house, not on our more familiar western shore of Lake Michigan, but on the eastern shore. And I guess he was right. And being right about that is one of the challenges that faces small and mid-sized cities in America today, but it's a good one to have. A place to live is usually defined among the basic necessities of life, along with food and clothing. But after we agree on that modest baseline, things start to get complicated. Are there standards that any place must provide? Heating or cooling, indoor plumbing, protection from the elements. What does it mean for housing to be a right? Does it mean that a person knit into the fabric of civic life with a job, paying taxes, doing their bit, must be able to afford a place to live? That's where things start getting a little squirrely. As many of you know, because of the work you do, there are more and more places in America thriving because of exclusivity, prospering in a narrow sense because they are economic monocultures that keep robust income tax receipts, have busy cash registers, contributing sales and other taxes to a jurisdictional bottom line, that think they've got the best of all worlds. They offer gracious year-round or part-time living to residents who can afford to buy in with lifestyle and amenities and services, in effect, underwritten by the economic struggles of public employees and service workers. It often goes unspoken. It's often reluctantly acknowledged. And during the pandemic, it became even more uncomfortable and a sharp relief problem. The clustering of economically secure households, the rising sale prices of homes as money remained very, very cheap to borrow, but virtual moats being built around various cities. It was handy to get a package left at your doorstep by an Amazon driver. It was convenient to have the doorbell ring and find a DoorDash courier at your front door with a hot meal. It moved from being a mere time saver to something more like a lifesaver to see the Amazon Fresh or Peapod truck roll up to the front door with a week's groceries. But when it came time for everyone to go to sleep, the people on one side of the moat knew that they could pull the drawbridge up. They knew the DoorDash guy had to go somewhere else to sleep. Where? Well, who knows? And given the logic of gig employment that obliges you only to think about the circumstances of life of another for the seconds that he or she is serving you, really, who cares? Who cares where that person goes after five or seven or nine? The combination of winner-take-all housing markets and the rise of the gig economy and the way we use lines of municipalities, counties, cities, boroughs, townships as devices to happily capture and only reluctantly pool resources drew an even sharper contrast than usual across the American landscape. The use of these lines allows us to make somewhat artificial distinctions into pretty significant ones. Inside a tiny and affluent enclave, the owners of big dollar homes can decide to tax themselves heavily to fund schools with the best labs, the most effective veteran teachers, the best athletic fields, the highest paid coaches. While just a handful of miles away, four high schoolers are sharing a Bunsen burner and the ball fields are unusable after a heavy rain. That's a long-standing feature of the game as it's played in America. But housing costs have followed a trajectory different from the other things we acquire. A trend line showing wages over the last 50 years and the cost of a house over the last 50 years shows a sharp divergence after the 1970s. 
when I moved into my first apartment, it was a well-known rule of thumb that housing should cost one week's wages of the roughly four weeks in the month. That's drifted slightly higher to 30%, which is now the threshold for considering a household cost burdened. About half of the 43 million renter households in America are now officially cost burdened, with a rising share of that percentage severely cost burdened, that is, hitting the 50% mark of housing coming from a household budget. If a household aspired to home ownership in the decades after the Second World War, a remarkable thing happened in our country. Due to the opening up of vast parcels of land for construction, the building of highways, the advances in construction methods and materials, the inflation, the inflation adjusted cost of the median home in, sold in the U.S. declined in the two decades from 1953 to 1976. So in real terms, in dollar adjusted terms, it got cheaper to buy the average house. But after that, inflation adjusted wages in the middle quintiles began to stay right where they were and stagnant wages combined with skyrocketing interest rates pushed the dream of home ownership further away for many. And right about that time, the price of housing took off. There were undulations in the wave, but the trend was higher and higher until this century when the trend line pretty much did only one thing, go up like a rocket. Now the inflation adjusted like to like median home price stood at $329,000, roughly twice what it was 45 years earlier in 1976. The homeowners in Travis City and Palm Springs and Alameda and Scottsdale, Gross Point Farms and Beverly Hills and East Grand Rapids may be asked, well, where do your teachers live? Where do the cops live? Where do the waitresses and baristas and bakers at Stonehouse Bread live? Where do they glow after closing time? The first answer might be, I don't know. The more honest answer may be, I don't care. In the worst affected markets, municipal and service workers suffered the heavy burden of drive until you qualify. Using their automobile as a tool to get them from the places they earn a living to the places their salaries allowed them to live. From the point of view of the various stakeholders, I might not agree with the policies that got us there, but I understand how it worked. Communities of high prevailing real estate values want to keep it that way, understandably, and they perceive multiple dwellings or structures built with the intention of being rental housing as built realities that threaten the look and feel of the place they live, potentially threaten resale value. They are beyond the control of a smaller group of owners who share a common desire to play defense and control what gets built. In the public schools, smaller groups of homeowners who tax themselves heavily to support the public schools do not want to educate poorer kids. They threaten the very high standardized test scores that in turn keep the value of the houses high and besides, lower achieving kids are more expensive to educate. Places that are uniformly high value and using inward investment to intensify that trend, look at, look at the shops that open. Look at the high-end single location retailers, the national brands that use census tract data to locate their stores. They too have less interest in growing local population, in economically, ethnically, or racially diverse populations. Going to the barricades, to defend large required lot sizes, to outlaw in-law apartments, block two-family houses, keeps neighborhoods expensive, and places the burden on the very people depended on to make those places desirable places to live. Governments started moving into housing markets in a big way during the Depression, when the marketplace itself was not producing new housing in anything like a necessary supply. Over time, with few people coming out and explicitly saying so, the private market for housing concentrated on providing inventory 
for the wealthy and left the job of making sure there was a range of housing options to the government. Or they waited until government provided subsidies to either owners, renters, builders, or buyers to get lower cost housing made. Houses are kind of like automobiles. The ones chock full of options with fussier interiors and finishes not only sell for more money, that's obvious, not only is the sticker price higher, but the amount of profit per unit is higher. The amount of profit per square foot is higher. Affordable housing must respond to code so as to hit certain baseline targets of livability, but they do not include generally walk-in closets, stone countertops, high-end appliances, the bathroom tiles that mark the owner as a person of taste, sophistication, and means. Thus, cost-cutting in construction in order to preserve profit at sale is important for lots are smaller to put more units on each parcel, finishes are cheaper, heating and cooling less efficient and built for fewer years of operation at a low cost of maintenance. And the people who scrimped and saved and just squeezed through the front door of a house that was a reach for their family, a place that has made them voluntarily house poor, those households especially don't want lots of affordable units diluting the value of the exclusivity they've worked so hard to achieve. Costs come in places that are growing, from extending access to utilities, hooking new units to the municip municipal water and sewer grid. So, you know, there are costs involved in plunking a new house someplace, but those costs are often uh, distributed and not entirely borne by the new owner. We extol we celebrate, we revere efficiency in our economic life. We practically fetishize it. But we have other interests at stake that make efficiency only one variable, only one aspect of the interests at play when we build housing. So we have a situation where an understandable set of factors are arrayed on the landscape that cause a predictable reluctance to include affordable housing in a community mix even when elected and appointed officials understand completely, intellectually, from the data that affordable housing is needed. Part of the problem is, what do people think of when they think of affordable housing? Ugly housing. Affordable doesn't mean sturdy or resilient or well-made in the public mind. It's no surprise that when it's built, it's either designed to make small or only marginal impact on the availability of affordable units for rent or purchase in any given marketplace. Often it's cited away from everything else as if to say, yeah, we're being forced to build this and we're grudgingly building it. So we're going to put it way over there. So the people who live in it get the message. The people who drive by get the message. This is where those other people live. Markets markets for anything, for gold, for Bitcoin, for Beanie Babies, are driven by both hard-nosed calculation and by sentiment. And there are some quiet little secrets embedded in the way sentiment affects choosing a place to live and, in effect, choosing your neighbors. People who recognize the problem, people who've lived the problem, people who had a hard time finding a place to live themselves are not always your best advocate for people like themselves because they had to run the gauntlet. They had to settle for where their dollars would take them. They had to navigate the barriers of engineered exclusivity. And often, once the mission is accomplished, they don't want the people they worked so hard to escape joining them suddenly at the PTA in the supermarket or the nearest public park. Because we perceive the stakes to be so high, they can sometimes see their allies up the ladder, not the ones behind them on the lower rungs, as their allies. Now, my, I haven't had a chance to look at who's in the room. My apologies in advance to anyone in the audience named Karen. But the Karen explosions in recent years, people who appoint themselves as arbiters of the presence, of the behavior, of the propriety of others, 
is rarely attached to the conversation about affordable housing, but it's a direct correlate to them. The ones who come over and ask, who are these people? Are they supposed to be here? Did they come from some other adjacent town to use the facilities that I pay for? In a lot of Americans' minds, tragically, the intimate association between race and ethnicity and household income and location give those Karens a rough yardstick, a down and dirty way to calibrate who's legitimately present and who's not, who should be barbecuing in a park and who should not. This kind of stuff has gone on forever. What's changed is that everyone walks around 24-7 with a high-def video camera in their pockets, making it possible to record the way stereotyping merges with the imagined need to defend turf, with the assumptions of belonging. And you get some hot and bothered, self-appointed defender of neighborhood integrity demanding to see a permit for a family party, uh, calling the cops on a couple checking into their Airbnb, or demanding a local address from a group of girls entering a public pool. What is unspoken, and sometimes spoken, is, I paid for this. I earned this. This is mine. One of the deeply embedded ironies in all this is the degree to which oases of high-income residents and high-value housing have throughout the decades after World War II relied on a bewildering array of frank and open and quiet and opaque subsidies to maintain their viability. At the same time, they stoutly declare to the outside world, I got mine, you go get yours. These communities use their significant political clout to keep those necessary but sometimes undesirable shared aspects of modern life away from themselves, lest a solid waste transfer station, a sewage treatment plant, an electric substation and its emanating transmission lines, or convenient walkable access to public transit interfere with the aesthetics and thus, they believe, the home values of their community. And they will continue to create solid waste, continue to flush their toilets, use electricity, and employ the people who come a long way on public transit to work for them. Local officials know, deep down, provision must be made for all kinds of residents, but they also know, deep down, that the game can be won by keeping those people as far away as possible, somehow at arm's length, unnecessary evil. At a coffee break during a regional housing conference in Kansas City a number of years ago, I had a member of a county board brag to me that he and his colleagues had not approved a permit for a multiple dwelling in 13 years. I was horrified, he was proud. At the same conference, I had another county official complain to me that wealthy people were putting bigger and fancier new houses at the end of old, unimproved roads to give them maximum views and maximum lack of density. And then, once they're in their new house, they begin pressuring local authorities to pave those roads, complaining that pebbles thrown up from the road were wrecking the paint jobs on their luxury SUVs. So buy an all-terrain vehicle, drive it on less than pristine terrain, and then complain when it dings your paint job. But they don't want to pay the $13,000 that it would cost to tarmac up to their front door. I grew up in a neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York, where when I was a boy, almost all the existing housing was built between 1910 and 1955. It had been rolling farmland, then subdivided by early 20th century developers trying to predict the path of future commuter lines. The marketplace provided, in an era before government really was a heavy participant in housing markets, an array of choice, an array of form, an array of cost that made it possible to find appropriate housing at every stage of life. The wide avenues near the subway stations had big apartment buildings, 
and smaller multiple dwellings. The cross streets had detached single-family and semi-detached two-family and four-family homes side by side on the same block. A young couple could marry, add children, raise children, see them off to their own households, and retire without ever having to leave the area, changing form as needs changed and taking advantage of a diverse market, and many people did. A family could see its economic circumstances rise and fall, depending on individual forces and trends in the wider economy, and they could adjust without having to leave entirely. You may be thinking, well, come on, that's teeming, crowded, high-density New York. Of course, there was diverse form. But my neighborhood was really like a mid-sized city. 85 to 100,000 people, depending on which boundaries you used, and a large number of people worked in the area as well. We kids rarely left the boundaries of what in effect operated as a small town. We walked to our elementary school with money wrapped in a handwritten note for the grocer or the butcher. We ran errands on foot. My mother never even had a driver's license. My father only drove pretty much on the weekends. This is not some unattainable brigadoon, some imaginary utopian village that rises from the mists and then disappears. This was a life our country provided for millions of people in the 20th century until we made choices. Choices often shaped for us by government policy, economic policies, and that will-o'-the-wisp, the fashions of valorized living that made it seem like that old life was no longer desirable, no longer able to be lived. So now we've got to engineer our way out of policies that move to their ultimate eventual conclusion and left us with whole towns where the only choice for a young, let's say, college graduate coming home with a diploma is to move away. Left us with whole towns of construction monocultures where empty nesters cannot choose any kind of house, but something exactly like the one they already live in, even though they don't need all those bedrooms, even though the owners dread next winter and snow removal, even though the owners aren't excited about having to maintain an eighth of an acre of lawn anymore. We are on the front end of a massive demographic transformation in our country as baby boomers the oldest of them now 75, the youngest already entering their late 50s, present marketplaces all over America with tremendous challenges. Millions of people will move from one region of the country to another. Millions of people will sell their primary asset, their family home, in order to downsize and right-size for a stage of life that no longer requires multiple bedrooms and baths. Gen Xers, already in their 50s, have long been in the home buying market, but they're a relatively small age cohort. Waiting behind them, millennials who do not covet their grandparents' homes. Some of the swanky subdivisions that rose on old farmland or in exurban towns in the 80s and 90s may turn out to be white elephants because nobody's going to want to buy them and many people aren't going to be able to buy them at any price. Some of them will become albatrosses around the necks of older Americans who are finding them harder to maintain, more expensive to heat, and they want to shed the obligations, cash in their chips, in many cases in order to fund the rest of their lives. And they might find that the place that looked so great when they moved in with a 20-foot atrium ceiling in the entranceway and an enormous kitchen island is not the dreamed of object of desire for smaller, heavily indebted younger families. The median age for a Michigander is just about 40. Nearly a fifth of the state's residents are 65 and older. You may not be able to dictate to master plan who your buyers and your new residents are, but you ought to be thinking, and I know many of you are, about who does the buying? Who does the paying? Who needs services at the beginning of life, pre-K and summer parks programs, 
school lunch and aftercare for young kids with working parents, and who needs services closer to the end of their lives. I know my 83-year-old father, who lives, sadly, 565 miles away from me, had a very hard time during the worst of the pandemic, since my much closer brother, sister-in-law, niece, and nephews simply could not be around him safely. A school teacher, a county court security officer, and high school students, all of them were constantly immersed in unplanned and not always protected contact with any number of people. So he lived for the brief human contact provided by his county's Meals on Wheels service. He got to see a friendly face at least once a day, and it mattered a lot, and it wasn't free. Revenue is like a barrel. Narrow at the top and bottom of the age cohorts. Costs are like a barbell, wide at the top and bottom and narrow in the middle. You might feel pretty confident, sure that you've got the kind of commercial vitality that makes you a jobs magnet, uh, bringing revenue of various forms. And since service workers are just imported for the day, keeping the costs low. Many of you may not be so sure you can pull that trick off long term. Americans as a whole, probably the vast majority of them, would not be in agreement. Uh, uh, excuse me. Americans as a whole, and I, I'm going to give everybody a break and speculate that the vast majority of them would agree. They would nod in agreement if you ask them about the command to love your neighbor. But when you ratchet up the challenge by wondering out loud, well, who is your neighbor? It starts to get more complicated. As we've seen in the very recent past, Americans are hardly of one mind when it comes, for instance, to the effects race has on life chances and family trajectories. For every person who laments the existence of systemic racism, there's another who denies that it even exists. Michigan, is 70% white. That is, white at a higher rate than the country as a whole. The country is about 64% white, so the differential in 2020 is not that broad. But in the middle of the century, when the U.S. is home to a white plurality rather than a white majority for the first time in all its existence, who will buy the homes in previously all-white towns? the year-round residents, and the carefully tended second homes. Who will patronize the businesses, many of which will be started in the coming 10 years? Houses last a long time. They are not like World's Fair pavilions, built for show, only to be dismantled in a year or two when the show closes. Your built environment makes durable and sticky claims on the land, that are sometimes hard to work around. Think of what planners and, um, and zoning officials and mayors and city managers are trying to figure out all across the country as they look at regional shopping malls. A retail reality of the 1980s, now rendered in steel and concrete, vast, empty, not generating uh, sales taxes, but you've still got to figure out what to do with this enormous thing that nobody wants anymore. Your built environment dictates how we move around, how we acquire the necessities of life. Today's 70 year old, a member of the largest, healthiest, and longest lived cohort of seniors ever to exist in the history of the world. Well, a lot of them can drive everywhere. They're still at an age where they can use their car to knit together the daily tasks of life. In 15 years, when that same person, let's say a guy is 85 and his wife is 83, there's no guarantee that they'll both be able to drive. There's no guarantee, certainly, that they will both want to drive to accomplish every task of daily life. I'm not telling you things you don't already know, but the near-term focus of plans and designs sometimes 
astonishes me. I mean, I'm old, but I'm not that old. I'm 64, but I want to walk everywhere rather than take the car. And even in my city of 700,000 people in a metro of about 4 million, I can't. What will you have to say when plans are being made that put a solid, rigid imprint on the land about what your place will be like to be young in, in 10 years, in 20 years? What will the place you're working in be like to be an old person in, in that near-term future? For the people who are still very young, where do you imagine their parents will work? When they finish college, will moving to the town they grew up in be attractive? Will it even be possible? Here I'm not speaking specifically to you as individuals or the places you work as spe specific examples of this heedlessness because, frankly, I don't know. But when I look at what's being built all over America, I shake my head in wonder. I wonder what people are thinking. At base, they're concluding that all the hard things will be done by others. Home care for aging people, building schools, recreational and rentals, uh, re rental housing, retail space. We talk a good multi-use game. We talk a good live-work game. We talk a good walkable game. But for all that, there's no shortage of places with no sidewalks, there's with endless copies of a single style of home, situated on the lot in the same way, roughly the same number of square feet, selling for a few percentage points of each other in sale price. There's no shortage of places where no one seems to have asked themselves, who lives here? At what stage in their lives? Who can buy here? And who will be able to sell? And to whom? A reckoning is coming in American zoning, as marketplaces will have the final say, not codes. Codes will not have the final say. The market will. But codes will first try to have the definitive say, and thus render markets rigid and unresponsive to realities. Regions like yours have choices to make about real lifestyle questions about opportunity, about who is a citizen worthy of your concern, worthy of your care about the quality of their lives. Draw the circle too narrowly, and it's going to cost you. Maybe not even today. There are definitely short-term gains to be won in short-term planning. But those costs will roll out for decades to come. I worry about all of this because a lot of the other splits and tears in American society, a lot of the arguments that we have with each other right now, the fights that we saw on American streets last year, move in the same slipstream with some of these deep questions about where people get to live, how much of their household budget they have to pay for housing, where do people get educated, what's the capitation, the cost per head in one school district as opposed to another. And who came up with this system? What are the predictable, understandable outcomes of these decisions? I think a lot of us know. I think a lot of us know about the inner clockworks, the inner machinery of how these things operate. But they're a little embarrassing to say because they have outcomes that we understand implicitly but are uncomfortable to talk about. So. Thank you for having me with you and giving me a chance to talk to you about some of these very things. And I welcome your questions. Thank you, Ray. That was incredible. Uh, <laughs> your, your stream of consciousness and the way you tell a good story is uh, uh, obviously your training over the years has paid off. That, that was a tremendous presentation. I really appreciate your time. And um, so I don't see the questions or how to do that. And hopefully Yaro can, can maybe get us involved, but I'll use my privilege as a sponsor and <laughs> as a, to, to maybe ask the first one. But I was interested in a couple of your stories, uh, particularly the, the Brooklyn story where you grew up. That, that was uh, the description you had, the picture I had in my head was very much a middle-class 
uh, you know, like, like the idyllic middle class neighborhood type type thing. And, and that seems to be something that's disappearing. And, and is that related to maybe that growing gap of um, uh, haves and have nots or uh, I, I, is the middle class disappearing, I guess, is where I'm going with that question. Well, the, the cool thing about that neighborhood and uh, the way that it worked out for me, frankly, uh, I was able to grow up in an economically diverse neighborhood. Uh, and we don't make, because of the way we build and acquire housing now, uh, there aren't as many opportunities for that today because the siting and construction and zoning of housing and requirements that we place on uh, developers mean that largely a lot of people of the same economic status are going to move into a new place to live or move into existing places to live. And that tendency ends up reinforcing itself uh, by ha giving people incentives to play the kind of defense I was talking about. Um, it is scary uh, to a lot of people, and that doesn't mean they're bad. It, it means that they are anxious about the fact that so much is at stake. They worry about uh, highly economically diverse neighborhoods because it's feared that the people at the bottom of any distribution will pull down the rest, pull down the interests of everybody else in the neighborhood. But I was able to live in an apartment building and go to, go to school with kids whose families owned, in some cases, very nice houses. There was a diversity of cost, a diversity of household income, that was reflected in the places that there were for people to live. And when you walked out onto the nearby shopping street, our, our main drag, which eventually had a lot of its vitality siphoned away by a nearby mall, uh, you had a, a diversity of offerings that made it possible for the, the literally well-heeled to buy expensive things. And on that same shopping street, uh, lower cost options for families that could not afford to spend as much on clothing or household appliances um, or or furnishing furnishings. So uh, I have watched as the way that we design places to live and the way that we build new places to live have almost purposely made that kind of life, which worked for a lot of people, possible. Uh, it wasn't idyllic. It had its problems like any like any place else, but it also offered opportunity for parents, for families that were still in the middle or lower rungs of the ladder to be aspirational. My parents, after I moved away from home um, and left the apartment that I grew up in, uh, were able to buy a house. So they moved from the main avenue in an apartment building to a single family house on the side street and lived in it for, for 30 years after that. Uh, that was something made possible by that continuity of form. They moved from a two bedroom apartment to a four bedroom house. And, um, you know, for, for my father who, who came from Puerto Rico in the 1950s, leaving, you know, just horrendous rural poverty in the Northwest corner of the island, he thought that he had you know, gotten the golden ticket, was living the American dream, but that was made possible by that continuity of form, and I, I really value it. The other thing that hit home for me, Ray, as somebody who's at the tail end of the ba baby boom generation, um, the, the, maybe the need to be more deliberate as we plan where our senior years are going to be and how, how we move from our large homes uh, as empty nesters to something more manageable in our senior years. So that was a great uh, message and I'm glad you shared that. I do see some questions popping up. Uh, Yaro, do you wanna facilitate those or uh, should I be doing that? I can chime in here. So Ray, we have a question from um, somebody here. It says, you did a good job of describing the problem. What do you see as a range of the appropriate responses? And please be as descriptive and expansive as possible. Well, part of the problem 
is uh, can be addressed by jurisdictions, whatever they are, townships, boroughs, counties, cities, villages. They have to stop resisting the uh, the efforts to build affordable housing. Many play this interesting game where they say, well, we don't have to build it here in the township, but as long as it's adjacent or it's in the county, or they keep using wider radiated circles. That's the place where it really needs to go. It's a, it's like, you know, everybody knows we need it, but if I can avoid providing it and talk about how we need it, then that's the best of both worlds. We got to stop doing that. And I think in in talking to the public about why it's necessary um the the winning argument is not that we're going to bring in lower income people that's not a not an easy sell i think the continuity of form argument and the continuity of availability the um the life segments argument is more of a winner um, telling people about the inability of their own children to live in their home, own hometown is more of a winner than saying, well, really, we have to have a place for the, um, the sales girl at the J. Crew to be able to live. That's not as, not as winning an argument. I, I don't want to sound cynical about this, but I've watched how the politics go down on this for a long time. And... Um, Affordable housing just as, as a proposition is not going to be a winner in a lot of communities. So you have to appeal uh, to people's rationality and also to the fact that we live in families, uh, we live in communities where there is continuity of need, where there is um, the challenge of trying to live in a way that, uh, that more closely resembles uh, the the needs of this time of your life and you know all those people who in their middle age their high earning years bought those 3,000 square foot houses they don't want them anymore it's not clear who's going to buy them they got to move and in many cases their household's future uh, sustainability relies on being able to move to another place uh, to live out the last part of their lives. We're living, you know, I, I was talking to my, um, my financial planner a couple of weeks ago, and um, we sat with the paper, the piles of papers, and his computer screen, which he kept turning around to show me things. And he basically said, well, look, you know, if you, if you make it to 70, you've got a, like, 50% chance of turning 90. And frankly, I can't, I won't be, if, if I'm that lucky, which I'm not counting on, um, I won't be able to do the things to take care of this place that I'm sitting in right now. Uh, when I'm, you know, 86, I'm, I'm just not going to be able to shovel the walk and, and shovel <laughs> the front stairs. I'll be lucky if I can get down and back up the front stairs. We have to be able to see human need in a broader spectrum and also recognize the responsibility to meet that need. Right now, we've been very successful saying, yes, I recognize that's a need. Maybe that guy over there can fulfill that need and it just isn't working for us. Thank you. So we have a few other questions coming in. Um, one is, can you comment on any communities you know of that are successfully integrating residents with disabilities, both physical, developmental and neighborhoods and housing decisions? don't know if that's something you can speak to. Well, disabled people uh, of various kinds can get carve-outs in the law and get local carve-outs uh, that make their needs a little bit more meetable. Because often um, independent living for the adult disabled uh, also means providing low cost options, but there are often subsidies for those options. And um, I think people, people think of those households in a different way from just 
regular low-income households. And it doesn't carry the burden of associations between household income and race and ethnicity that sometimes um, accompanies the phrase the, that, that gives kind of an electric charge to the phrase low-income housing. So it doesn't carry as much of the burdens. But I think we've been, we've been remiss uh, <clears throat> in, in providing places that are uh, relevant to the needs. You know, when you are designing, for instance, group homes, I was, I was watching something on Netflix uh, a couple of days ago where uh, an autistic young woman was living in a group home that was uh, subsidized by her municipality. And we see through the TV camera, her mother coming to visit her at her place, which has a private bedroom with a lockable door, but a shared kitchen, uh, a private bathroom. It was in Australia where they, you know, they've made local choices that more easily include provision of that kind of thing. At one time or another, a majority of Americans will have some form of disability in their lives. And we have not taken account of that. Uh, we have not made sure that in any development, there are uh, a certain number of units that have lower counters that have um, toilets with lift bars, that have showers that are step in rather than step over a threshold and, and into the shower. We're just, this is low hanging fruit. This is really easy. Um, if you're building a group house uh, for developmentally disabled people, uh, there's often an on-site manager, uh, in effect, a house mother or house father. Uh, who makes sure that the needs of the residents are being met. That needs to be a sort of apartment located inside the complex. There are design answers for all these challenges. It's almost as if we're we save ourselves the trouble of having to worry about these things by pretending that they either don't exist or that somebody else will take care of them. And it's it's horrendous. It's really horrendous. All right. Okay. So we do have a time for, I think, one more question. Um, this one is, um, you mentioned that affordable housing has a stereotype of being cheap, ugly, dirty, yet the rising cost of construction, both in materials and labor, affordable and workforce housing, not only needs to be subsidized, but is forced to use cost-cutting tactics, which reinforces the stereotype. Do you have any thoughts on how we address that? I, I recognize some of those problems. I think current um, current supply chain problems, current tariff problems, fights with Canada over wood and the various near-in problems are things that long-term can be handled, can be addressed. Uh, there are construction techniques that have made uh, building housing of all kinds of uh, types and ranges uh, cheaper and faster and more efficient and more energy efficient as well. I refuse to believe that we can't answer some of these challenges with design. I also refuse to believe that it's an accident that some of these places are as ugly as they are, that they meet the street in the way that they do, uh, and it's not on purpose. I think a message is being sent to the street by the, um, the ugliness of a lot of what's understood, that there's a shared understanding that this is being built to be affordable housing. Good design, you know, they do it in other places in the world, so it's not some, you know, far off dream that we could never aspire to. You'd have a harder time in Europe picking out the affordable housing than you would in, in, uh, in an American community. And that tells me something. They're not smarter over there. They just have social policies that are different. They don't have better designers over there that we can't possibly emulate. No, we have good architects. We have brilliant designers. We have people who 
create works of art on a blueprint, we can do it too. It doesn't have to be shabby. It doesn't have to be ugly. And we're doing such amazing things with finishes. We're doing such amazing things with materials. Um, I, I just don't believe that it's a coincidence that a lot of our affordable housing looks as bad as it does. Thank you, Ray. I want to bring Carlin back in uh, for just a second to kind of close us out here, but I wanted to thank you so much for joining us. I know uh, we hope to be in person, but virtual is the best we can do right now. So thank you so much for being here and I'll let Carl Carlin close us out. Well, once again, Ray, an honor to be uh, affiliated and associated with your keynote address and to have the opportunity to introduce you. And thank you so much for your time um, spending with us in, in Northwest Michigan. And hopefully we can get you back here in person in a, at a future time and, and get to chat more um, in depth about uh, your, your great views on, on, on just how our country is working right at the moment. So we really appreciate your insight and, and value. Yaro, thank you for your leadership with the Housing Summit. I know you've worked your tail off with this, uh, with this event. And uh, uh, I'm so glad it's continuing just because of the importance of the subject matter and that uh, Housing North is keeping it front of mind for people in Northern Michigan. So really appreciate all of your efforts. And then thanks to all the audience who joined us. Obviously, if you're if you're uh, taking time to tune into uh, keynote addresses and breakout sessions about housing, you must be passionate about the cause. And we are just grateful for all that everyone is doing to try to address this crisis in Northern Michigan. So Consumers Energy, again, proud to be a sponsor of all of this and, and thank you all very, very much. Awesome, thank you everyone. And we will see you at the rest of the sessions. Take care. Bye-bye.